All right. Welcome, everybody, uh, to uh, Radical Women Seeing Red uh, at Odetta Gallery uh, through the end of the month, well, through September 26th. And the exhibition is a three-part series. It uh, is both outdoors and in the main gallery space. And then we have a solo exhibition down in the cellar gallery with Patricia Miranda's piece, Patricia Miranda Seeing Red. So today we're really talking about the main gallery space, which encompasses two rooms and a flat file and uh, the outdoor space we spoke about last week, but I'll introduce it slightly. Uh, radical Women Seeing Red is a group of seven radical women artists. We all traveled to London last year at exactly this time. And uh, we bonded over art and just in general, a deep love of seeing art and then sharing our histories as artists when we were viewing all the great museums in London. And um, so we kept up a conversation as we got back to the States. And uh, that was uh, a conversation on the WhatsApp uh, platform. And from there, we continued it into all of a sudden the pandemic breaking out. And our conversations took a much more personal tone as we continued to share information as artists. We also shared information about our families, how we were feeling and so on, our concerns. And we became a real support system. In the midst of all of that, Patricia Miranda was steadily working in her studio in Portchester and had this amazing set of pieces in the background that we were all witnessing building up in her studio space. So I got to do a studio visit and realized that it was time to offer a solo exhibition to Patricia. She and I had discussed getting her in as a guest curator to focus on an exhibition on the color cochineal and red. And I was already writing a show called Radical Women to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment. So it made sense to put these pieces all together and let Patricia become the curator at Odetta for this exhibition. Uh, Radical Women Seeing Red is focused on cochineal, which is one of her primary focuses in her background as an artist. She's an expert on the, the hue, the dyeing methods, has run many courses on different pigments and dyes and um, and cochineal is is one of her deep interests in her work as you can see in her solo exhibition. So I wanted to just welcome you all to the gallery to the conversation. We're all going to be moderated by Patricia as she talks about her uh, project as curator here. And I want to just also express a deep gratitude to everybody for your interest in Odetta Gallery. I will be moving out of the physical space at the end of this exhibition, and I'll become a satellite curator gallery and uh, looking forward to the future just being a little bit freer. But I'm really happy to end it with a group of friends here that uh, share a deep love of art and adventure together. And I'm hopeful that one day we'll have a chance to get to London together again. So I'm gonna hand it off to Patricia now. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm so excited to speak to you tonight about this exhibition that I've curated as part of this, these three kind of shows that are happening at Odetta Gallery. <clears throat> um, the gallery is open by appointment and we would love for people to come and see the shows and just get in touch and we can kind of, you know, meet you there, not anytime, but almost anytime. Um, it's all of the shows are really things that are wonderful to see in person. You can also see my talk um, 
which was recorded last week. And um, both of the talks, this talk will be recorded and both of them will be available online. So you can find that those links through Odetta Gallery. So if you want to pass it on to friends and all of that tonight, um, I have the great privilege of focusing on this intimate and a very special exhibition um, that I was really honored to curate. And thank you, Ellen and Odetta for the support of my work, but also for entrusting me with this, <laughs> this wonderful opportunity in the midst of what are really challenging times. Um, I wanna start just by saying that there's a beautiful catalog of all of the exhibitions that was designed by the amazing Patricia Fabricant. So thank you, Patricia, for that. Um, it is available as a free PDF. It's available on, on my website, on Odetta's website, and I'm sure other, other people will have it on their website too if they don't already. So please check it out. There's an essay by Ellen, an essay by me, and an essay on my work by um, the artist and critic Jason Stopa. So it's a pretty special work. We're, we're really proud to have that archive of this opportunity in this exhibition. Um, so the, the, the notion of radical for Ellen started by uh, around the 100th anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment, women's right to vote. And my interpretation for this show, because it was in the midst of the pandemic and also it was very connected to this amazing group of women that I feel incredibly honored and privileged to be, have become family with, you know, not incidentally, I think sometimes these things are, are, you know, sort of ordained somehow, but we didn't all really know each other uh, when we went to London. It was a little bit of a kind of impromptu thing and, and through that opportunity kind of had this kind of crash course in, in each other's lives and in art. But then when the pandemic happened, really became an incredible support network, a chosen family. And I started to think of the radical nature of that and the radical nature of uh, women's collectives and the power of women getting together. Anytime women get together in a room, unbelievable things always happen. That has been the experience of my life, um, the transformational experience of my life. So I'm gonna give you a little walkthrough of the show. I'm not gonna talk about the individual works because the artists, this is a night for the artists to talk about their work, but to give you a little bit of a sense of the, um, of the space. One of the interesting things about this exhibition and about Odetta is that it's in a Harlem townhouse. So for my work in particular, being the lace materials that are uh, of the period of the townhouse, uh, that was a really interesting aspect of it. And for this show, you know, placing work in this kind of, especially under the rubric of the 100th anniversary and under the idea of women's collectives and the idea of women you know, families and the idea of the domestic and the domestic labor, all of those things seem to be reiterated in not only in the work of many of us, but also in the space. So one of the sort of, you know, joys and funs of curating, right, is um, is finding ways for the work to both be autonomous amongst itself, right, to stand on its own and its own powerful, with its own powerful voice, but then also be in conversation with the other work in the room. And that can be difficult and challenging when, um, you know, in a different kind of space or when the work is, it's not thematic in a sense. So uh, I wanted to have the work be installed in a way that, that kind of felt, um, I don't know, honored the space as this kind of intimate domestic space and also developed this kind of conversation, almost like we as the artists are in the room, right? Having a conversation through the language of our work. Um, so these conversations that we all, so you can see the kind of domestic nature of the space, which creates, you know, a, a different kind of an exhibition, one that I feel has a, a kind of an intimacy that's really special. And the work talks to to, its, to um, itself and to one another in interesting ways. We feel that we are kind of, you know, meandering our way through this conversation between these seven women. Um, so that was really exciting for me, both as, a, you know, a member of this chosen family, L London Calling Collective, but also as a curator and as an artist. So artists talking to artists, artists curating artists, I think is a kind of a unique, um, has a unique voice. So you can see that the townhouse has this, the brick walls and the, these wrought railing, wrought iron railings. And, and uh, I wanted very much for the work to be in conversation. And then just as, this is just a view down the stairs to my exhibition, which I feel is really wonderful way that the, the images on the walls and then the cards and then the, and then the way that you can, you get a little sneak preview of my work as you walk down was a really wonderful connector between the two spaces, upstairs and downstairs. Um, the, the work continues in the, in the back room of Odetta. 
um, with these wonderful intimate pieces. I keep saying that word, but I feel like that's maybe that's the theme for tonight is sort of intimate space, intimate relationships, intimate works, intimate exhibition. I feel like that's that's what I'm thinking. Um, and uh, so here's some details of some of the works. Again, these artists are going to talk about them. So I'm trying to give you a sense of the space around. Uh, I feel like that while the while we were sheltering in place we stayed connected through the digital space and i think that that the radical nature of the threads that we created the ties that we had through that whatsapp is one of the things that's most deeply meaningful to me in this exhibition as curator and the relationships the the work reflects the relationships between these artists individually and as a group and you know helps us to reimagine how we are going to think about community now and during the pandemic as we did with each other and then also as we move forward. I mean, these kinds of new ways of building family and creating community are not going to go away. So I'm really interested as a curator and as an artist in the ways that we can reimagine space, right? Digital space, communal space, intimate space, domestic space, all of those kinds of spaces as artists as we move forward. So uh, with that, I really want to give the artists the, the bulk of the evening to talk about their work. I'm going to just briefly touch on my work. There's a painting on the right here. The small painting is also mine, but I don't, I'm not going to talk about that tonight. I'm just going to say a few words about this piece because I feel like it really, um, before I really hand it over to the rest of the artists, I feel like this piece is in many ways wouldn't have happened without the collective because these are doilies that didn't exist before we were installing. So the, this, this incredible, joyful exercise of working with these artists, we all came together to install and we're thinking about how this might work and the outdoor exhibition and all of that. And so this particular piece grew out of that collaborative nature of the collective because these were doilies that I had from um, an outdoor installation that's actually still up at uh, Yukon Avery Point. Um, and the, so I had these doilies and I was, thinking about what I would do with them. And the zip ties became an important part of the outdoor installation. And so um, zip ties are not something that you, I would normally be using in my work. I have this, you know, it's just, a, it's just a material I would never use. And what was amazing to me was that through this conversations and, and interactions throughout the show, through the installation, the zip ties suddenly became possible for me. And I, the way that they kind of poke out into the space and have a kind of a sense of humor, which I never think of my work as having humor in it. <laughs> um, this has gotten me to kind of get to use a material that I wouldn't have used and to find, you know, another way, another sort of avenue for the same language to find something that has a little bit more of this kind of playful, um, you know, kind of playful feeling to it. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, pass it on to the artist. I'm going to say to everybody, if you have questions, um, type them in the chat and we will, and keep yourself muted. And then we'll all, we can all unmute as we speak later, um, as we uh, have, take some Q and A. Thank you so much for coming and thank all of you, London Calling Collective. I love you guys. So <laughs> thanks, congratulations. Hi everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you, Ellen, for letting us have this show in your space. Thank you for Patricia for putting it together. Um, it so much has changed. We were just in London in October last year and oh my goodness, I can't believe how fast it's all gone. Um, so let me talk about the pieces that are in this show. Gonna... Okay, so this first one, um, a lot, I guess I'm pretty sure everybody that's in the audience also is aware of another, um, collective, the Among Friends Collective, um, a group that uh, Patricia Fabricant and Beth Derry and I, the sh we put that show together. We've done two iterations of that. And with the very first um, Among Friends, that was the first time that I was using the sewing machine on my paper pieces. Um, and that was just because with the Among Friends situation, I think a lot of people really experimented that time with the papers that we handed out. And because it was such a one-off, just kind of did something crazy. So I certainly did and was painting on it and using the sewing machine. So, and then that changed, that just became part of my practice and, um, and doing that on these small uh, pieces. 
So this piece and the others that are in the show, um, they're all on this uh, small kind of handmade Indian paper. They're all mostly gouache. Um, and I think like everybody else during the pandemic, you know, I think everybody kind of moved their studios to their kitchen tables and worked small, um, almost like in a therapeutic way. So I was just doing like all these small kind of explorations over and over and over. And the first ones I did were these ones that had these eye icons or iconography. Um, and there's another one in there. And um, I guess just because I was sad. I mean, the whole situation was so sad. So, um, and then I was just going into it and using the sewing machine as a drawing tool um, and playing with the threads. And I, I don't know how to sew. I don't, I am not trained in it. I think, you know, the most I did was enough to get my brownie badge. Um, but the sewing machine I have has all these um, different stitches that I can choose from. And then playing with tensions and also flipping the paper over and actually showing like the wrong side of the sewing that you wouldn't if you were making clothing. I'm using that um, to create a line and using the different color threads, obviously in a formal way, and then just exploring with that. So. That's a, so, and leaving the threads, I really like the way the threads, it's almost becoming like this weird sculptural piece. Um, so along with the pieces that I'm doing with the sad eyes, I was doing a lot of just abstractions. Um, people that know my work, this is really kind of reminiscent of my abstract painting work. Um, but again, using the threads, um, sometimes using similar colors to kind of enhance the texture and sometimes using a contrasting color to create some kind of weird tension. So, so the, the, the longer pieces are about 15 inches and then the smaller pieces are just the pieces ripped in half. Really, these were um, kind of like those Indian paper books that you can buy that I had gotten that were cheap. I just really like the unevenness of the paper and the texture of it. Um, and so the smaller ones are just me tearing the paper out in half. So you can, they all kind of have a crease, but I kind of like that. I never like my stuff to be too precious or too perfect. I like that it has like a little scuff or a mistake um, yeah, and then using the sewing machine, obviously, it's like I, I, I'm just kind of winging it through the machine and letting the mistakes happen. And I really, really like that. So that's about it. If anyone has a question, I'd be happy to answer now, unless we're going to take them at the end. Yeah, we'll do questions at the end. So okay. people can type stuff in the chat so they can not lose track of their thoughts. <laughs> and we'll go through and every, let everyone uh, speak. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody, and thanks for coming. And thank you, Ellen and Patricia, for putting this show together and echoing what Alexi said and how much I've enjoyed getting to know you all in the last year. Um, I guess I'll just dive right in. My remarks aren't really directed at the specific work in the show, but more generally what I've been doing for the last year. So uh, throughout my painting career, I've kind of pivoted back and forth between figurative and abstract work. And I, every time I switch, it feels like I'm doing something really radically different, but I'm starting to see cross-pollination and the way that the two disciplines play off of each other. So after the 2016 election, I started doing self-portraits, just kind of, it felt urgent to do them. And I was looking inside myself and destroying them and weaving them together. And then they're just, I, I hit a wall at the end of last year. I could not look at my face anymore. I was done. So I started making these little gouaches and um, they were kind of a diversion that ended up taking over in terms of my practice. So um, I've always been interested in process driven work, um, mandalas, yantras, Aboriginal songline paintings, Islamic tiles, and especially recently the pattern and decoration movement. I saw a show when I was in LA earlier this year, just before the pandemic of pattern and decoration and it's actually coming here, I believe. But it interests me also in particular because it was a female-driven move movement using traditional women's work materials and techniques at a time sort of in rebellion to this against the masculinity of minimalism. And I think that really connects it to this collective idea as well, the women's collective that I'm now part of. And I'm also interested in the spiritualists like Emma Kuntz and Hilma Af Klint and Agnes Pelton, who's got a great show at the Whitney right now early Kandinsky, and some of my more recent contemporaries like Dan Zeller and James Sienna who do process-driven work. And um, basically, I'm interested in, in hand, in gesture, in pattern. I don't sketch them out in advance. I kind of have an idea and just run with it. 
Um, I, I'll, maybe I'll have a color in my head and then I'll just start playing with the tension of color and pattern and density. And um, I just like things that are beautiful and don't require a huge amount of explanation. So I don't know, I guess I, I'm done explaining it. Um, and we'll see what happens when I go back to the figure. I'll start looking at myself again. Maybe I'll bring these colors back in there. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Patty. Uh, can you hear me okay? You, okay. Um, so I have been, as some of you may know, casting these oil cans. I buy these very cheap oil cans and I make glass, cast glass um, images and, <clears throat> or equivalents, I guess you would say. And I light them with light boxes. And every single oil can I've made, I've, I've made about 90 of them, is different partly by accident because you can't cast two things to look the same and partly by design. I have all sorts of ways of switching them around, but, um, and I set them on light boxes and I have to say that in this show, they really look to advantage. They really look great. And one reason is this wonderful window. I was just there today. And here's another one that's on a beautiful shelf that Patricia Miranda came up with that I, I owe so much to the the curators in this show making, I think they make the work look so great. The oil cans, I keep calling them oil cans because that's how they start, but they have many, many associations. I kind of leave it up to the viewer. Obviously oil is one of them and fossil fuels. And this is an older, more disciplined way of using fossil fuels. Every one of these, by the way, is designed for a specific purpose in the bottom, which you may remember you kind of push with your thumb emits exactly the amount of oil for whatever machine is it is um, associated with it. So just so you know, but they could be vessels of light. They could be the biblical oils or vessels of eternal light. Joe Yarrington was saying today there, if you think of them as squirting oil, light oil out and sort of um, loosening up everybody's tightened up joints from this pandemic, you could see them as just doing that, just the way the light flows out of them, the way oil might. Some people see they're creaturely. Some people have said, one said they look like families waiting at the border. Uh, so anyway, I leave it to you, but they've had this magical way of exfoliating ideas. So those are the two installations of the oil cans, one in the window you can see from outside, which is really great. And then I have one other piece that is, um, this is a photographic, it's a print that I made from a photograph of an old painting that I did many, many years ago that's quite large. This, this is 18 by 24, but the painting was a lot bigger. And the shiny surface of the photograph is, reflects the resin that I use in the painting. So it's very accurate in that sense. I feel this is a map. The gold parts are a map of the Chinese terracotta soldiers buried in China. And I feel like when I was writing up for the catalog, what I saw as the, as the sort of connecting link between all the work and the show is tying the contemporary moment to the ancient past. And in this case, war, <laughs> because these soldiers are not lying peacefully in the ground, as you can see. There are dragon scales, there's you know, some kind of mountain cloud energy, there's all sorts of other activity that, and the, and the um, actual um, tombs are all kind of moving around. So, if you think of the oil cans as going back to the really ancient uses of oil, spiritual oil, eternal oil, contemporary fossil fuel oil, and these, this piece, which, which is a necropolis, a very ancient thing, but somehow still expressing the unfortunate presence of something of violence and war, it seems to me there's this connection between the work. <clears throat> So I welcome any questions and I welcome any new ideas about what any of these things put in your mind because that's the biggest pleasure for me is hearing what you guys associate with what I do rather than me telling you what I quote unquote planned. Usually I plan nothing, just to let you know. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine and uh, Josette. Oh, thank you. It's such an honor to be sharing with this amazing group of artists and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you briefly about my drawings. Um, I always work from observation and from my immediate surroundings. Um, I find drawing to be the most direct link to private time with the physical world. Um, while I'm making these drawings, 
Um, I try to be as present, playful, and of the moment as humanly possible. Um, these particular drawings were made from my rooftop studio in Bushwick, um, and um, which is a renovated knitting factory. It has giant windows overlooking Brooklyn towards Manhattan. The view is incredibly complex and at times overwhelming. It is always changing and sometimes almost too much to take in. Although I'm working from observation, I'm not interested in the appearance of the place, but more the heartbeat and the buzz of the place. I'm looking off in every direction simultaneously. I'm, in, I'm equally interested in what's near and what is far, um, as well as um, I'm, I'm drawn to spaces in between. Um, the next piece is um, called That Daffodil. And um, I also thrive on, on what I don't know. And I'm always looking to set up situations where I can become lost while I'm working. Sometimes I hang things in the windows, um, three-dimensional three wire drawings, um, things to interrupt and disrupt the view. Um, I, I make constructions out of found materials, um, packing materials. Um, sometimes I, I hang simple line drawings that I've made on mylar. In, in, on the glass. I also look at the plants that are in front of the windows and the plants that are outside of the windows. But for me, the fresh page represents an arena of possibility. Um, a single mark extends into a path and strolls through territory that is both familiar and unfamiliar. Um, my favorite drawing tool is a Japanese brush pen. And, um, I, I love it because the ink flows with this continual mark, but also once it, 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 it lands on the page, once it hits the page, it cannot be erased. So it's completely, you're committed. But I also save the, it's refillable. So I save the empty cartridges and sometimes I fill them with color or sometimes I start a drawing with a, a, dry, a dry mark. Um, the next image is called On Spot. And um, if I find myself getting any, into any kind of remote or mechanical mode while I'm drawing, I change the place on the page. Um, like if I find myself drawing bricks and, you know, feeling like it's becoming something that I know, I move to a new location um, just to shake things up. Um, sometimes I'm surprised that, that the drawings, that things all add up, um, but it's like giving, giving myself over to the process and having faith in this, 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 having faith in the process, basically. Um, I'm always hoping for, for um, some sort of surprises, discovering something I don't understand. That's when I'm the most interesting, interested while I'm working. Um, and despite the urgency of my process, as I work, time slows down. Um, and my work becomes an explanation or an exploration and a reflection of my inherent energy and reason for living. Um, so thank you for listening. It's a, an opportunity, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to share these pieces with you all. Thank you, Josette. Wonderful. Joe Harrington. Yes, thank you, Patricia. I wanted to thank you and uh, Ellen for setting this up. And um, everyone in the London Calling Group have been radically changed by uh, our talks and our associations. And um, the work that I did for this exhibition actually happened uh, after I heard about the show. So it's pretty immediate and kind of raw for me. And it's, um, I think it's sort of exciting because it's a little bit different than what I normally do. Um, the first piece that you see is, um, is uh, a piece that, uh, I was taking a lot of workshops actually, and I was doing potato prints and, trying some things that maybe I, I hadn't done before. I was also working in the kitchen and setting up a studio situation at home, which uh, I think most of us were. And the piece, this is two pieces. Um, one is a, a monoprint underneath. And as I was looking at it, it was kind of a random piece. I had a handkerchief that was lying around and I put it on top and I thought, you know, kind of, personified how I was feeling at that exact moment. Kind of just a scream, a rage, you know, a surprise. And I really liked um, that sense. And I think of the, the rest of the pieces I was doing, it kind of personified which, what I've always been interested in, which was chance and the found, whether it's a moment, object, person, how random experiences click into place, form a narrative, reveal the truth, all the work being shown, as I mentioned, happened while um, 
fully or partially sheltered in place and also in my kitchen on the street um, and also informed by our conversations. Um, so this is raging women behind the veil. I'm just looking at, I'm trying to remember the, the title, but it, raging women, woman behind the veil. And I, I like that sense of layering um, that I'm showing a couple of uh, slides for each piece just because they're dimensional pieces. So you have to walk around them a little bit. So um, this piece is red code mapping. Uh, it, it's an interesting piece. I'm showing you what it looked like as I was documenting it in the studio and then when it was installed. And these are all found pieces, but I love the idea of coding um, this map, which was um, used during World War II and was kind of mapping the movement of troops through Europe. Uh, I think this was from France. Um, seemed to me more abstract, like veins. And I do a lot with coding, and I just love the, the uh, finding these handkerchiefs, stacking them up, and saying, you know, there's a kind of marching aspect. And I, I, we've all felt like we're in something that is uncontrollable, uncontrollable, so that there's that sense of overwhelming power, I think, and how we're being transformed by what's happening to all of us collectively. Uh, the next piece is conversation with Lovejoy, and it's two pieces. It's actually a found photograph. Uh, I found it on the street. It was um, made, I found out, by Joy Love, uh, Margot Lovejoy. And um, it was outside, I'm not really sure why it was placed there, in a frame that was, the glass was cracked. And it was called Public Laundry. And I, I, it was just such an evocative piece at the time that I found it. Um, I've been concurrently working with uh, a folded, uh, reduced, a Xerox photographed and then Xeroxed and reduced um, New York Times uh, image from May 24th. And I felt like the conversation was also um, about public laundry and, and airing out and you know what we were all feeling. It's a, it's a flipped image of that page which lists up to that point all of uh, the people who had felt who had um, uh, died from the COVID-19. So uh, I felt, I felt uh, very connected and also I needed something that was going to manifest what I felt was uh, part of my grief. I needed an object of mourning and I thought maybe Margot and I could have a conversation. Um, the last piece um, is, uh-oh, <laughs> and kind of how I'm feeling right now. Um, this was done probably two days before the show opened or when I was supposed to come to the gallery with the pieces and um, I had been working on uh, it was a partially found piece, but it's a clamshell Coptic stitch book. And I started to insert images, um, also wax and reduced uh, photographs from newspapers and also the uh, New York Times. Um, there's a trace mono, uh, trace line, I'm trying to remember what it's called, trace monoprint. Um, that was just a testing scrap. And, uh, you know, in this workshop, it's like, put some text and see what happens. And that was exactly how I was feeling at the time. So the next slide of this also shows the back of the piece. And I love that hint to uh, this sense of body, the use of clam, the symbolism, the coding that goes into the objects. And it's sitting on a napkin ring, has the pedestal. So I, I really, I usually do really large installations and I love the intimacy and the immediacy of these pieces. I feel like it's such a, for me right now, it's a very honest response to what's happening around me. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. And our last artist of the evening, Ellen Hackle-Fagan. Ellen, are you muted? That's a big group. I had to go back four pages to find myself. Um, I love all of the discussion as you all are 
primarily artists in the room, I think you know, you get so busy putting these exhibitions together that you don't really speak to one another about the individual works. So this is a real treat for me as a participating artist and the gallerist. Um, so uh, I am known lately for my focus on the color blue and the series Seeking the Sound of Cobalt Blue. But my uh, investigation into the sonic aspects of color goes back much further. And uh, the three paintings that are a part of this exhibition actually were done in response to comparing visualizations to the notes in the ABC song Melody. And uh, they all ended up being the same note of this melody because they're all in the red family. So that's kind of interesting and they span two years. The first one is called Red. Um, I like to use objects that are mass produced. And in the case of this painting, these, are, uh, these tiny dots are the result of a wet on wet technique with ink and many, many layers. Um, but in each of those layers, I'll throw these small minuscule silicon caps onto the surface of the painting and let the paint dry around them. And it creates these wonderful uh, chemical reactions of the ink fighting off the edges of the um, silicon. And um, when the paint or ink is dry, then I'll remove the silicon uh, particles and you end up with almost a photogram-like remnant residue left on the surface. So red is a color that I've spent a lot of time with in my life as a painter. And I usually couple it with another color so that it'll play off of itself. This second one, RGB, is utilizing a similar wet on wet technique with ink and tempera on the top. And um, bubble wrap is the medium of choice, which uh, for me, bubble wrap when used as a step stamping mechanism feels like digital music. Um, and you can do fields of it. It can go into, depending on the scale of your surface and your sheets of bubble wrap, you can take it up to a very large scale. This happens to be small. This is eight by eight inches on clayboard. And uh, so I can go to the next one. And then this is the last of these three red paintings all centered on the melody uh, of the um, ABC song or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, all focused on the color E or the note E. And this one is red green. So playing again between uh, complementary colors to pop out uh, the, the color red essentially by giving uh, its opposite on the surface. And way underneath there, the initial wash also used um, paper towel as a stamping mechanism with a darker ink. Um, and if you come to the gallery, you'll get to see those uh, in, in a little closer detail. And uh, so, okay, we're not, we're gonna go to the outside after the flat files, Patricia. Okay. Would you like me to discuss the flat files? Oh, I mean, I can say uh, just a couple of words. I mean, you please chime in too. Uh, the flat files are, uh, Ellen always has these beautiful, those of you who have been to Odetta know that Ellen always does like a, a sort of a sub show in the flat files that sometimes is installation, sometimes is, you know, its own kind of show. And for this as curator, which is why I, I sort of <laughs> say Ellen can talk about it is I, I get, you know, I just said to the artists, ha have a drawer, you know, like I'm going to curate the, the, the installation show that's out in out in the in the rooms and uh, use those drawers however uh, you feel works for you. So I think that's what 
and oh, and each person has a drawer, and so they have this beautiful different character and a beautiful different feel. So I can scroll through them, Ellen, if you want to say anything. Um, this is Joe Yarrington's drawer. Again, using a found linen. Uh, Josette Urso. Oh, okay. Josette Urso, uh, some more of her beautiful drawings of her local environment on a more intimate scale. Patricia Miranda, again, the these wonderful color studies, and you'll see a relationship to these works in particular when I show you the outdoor installation. Just to, it's Patricia Fabricant. Oh, sorry. We're, that's okay. We're two Patricias in this group, so we have this constant, <laughs> we have a constant uh, Patricia problem. <laughs> and um, Alexis Rush Brock, two of her uh, paintings with sewn elements. And she actually has kind of stacks of these. Her pandemic fury of making <laughs> is, is seen very clearly in these stacks of beautiful drawings in the drawers as well as hanging, of course. And uh, two of my paintings from a series on uh, wood grains and vocals uh, done in 2012. And then Catherine Jackson has been uh, taking some of her sculptures and paintings and exploring uh, digital printing mounted on aluminum. She's been working with a master printer and really enjoying uh, seeing her work move into a different medium. And lastly, the uh, goal of putting Patricia Miranda in and uh, London Calling Collective or Radical Women Seeing Red the, the goal was to try to put an exhibition together with a group that if we got shut down again, we all would still walk away feeling happily fulfilled that we got to put our artwork together in a physical space. And that was a huge relief to me as the gallerist. And then as we were really forming uh, the London Calling Collective and Radical Women Seeing Red and Patricia Miranda Seeing Red. I was approached by Eileen Jang Lynch. And Eileen uh, also is a curator at Wave Hill and has a space in Brooklyn called uh, The Yard. So she's actively curating and she came up with an alternative to the pivot onto digital media for artists and gallerists. And she calls this exhibition Art Off Screen. I was invited to participate and immediately asked if our collective could be the participant instead so that in the event we got shut down, we would still have a group, beautiful work of art made available for us to enjoy sharing with a public. So we came up with the London Calling Collective, London Calling Red, and we worked with the architecture of the outdoor space. Uh, we also worked with Catherine Jackson's sculptures in the windows and Patricia Miranda's fabric works put together as the gateway entry and Patricia Miranda's uh, got some vertical lines of day glow tape that replicate her painting method in the flat file pieces. She does a lot of contrasting colors with line work in her artwork. So uh, London Calling Red is, gives passerbys a chance to view the facade through the red lenses. Um, whether they're outside looking in or inside looking out. Um, and this installation will also be on view through September 26th. So we hope you'll come and see the exhibition. You can make an appointment with either me or Patricia via email, phone call, you name it. Uh, we'd love to see you. So at that, I'm going to stop that chair. Thank you so much. I have to say that that it's Eileen Jeng, and that's my typo there. So I apologize to Eileen for that, Eileen Jeng. And it's Patricia Fabrican who did the stripes on the um, on the windows. So uh, 
I see that there's lots of wonderful things in the in the chat. I feel like um, I'm going to take a little look through. And if anybody has, I just had a couple of, I, Catherine Jackson, I was thinking of the Wizard of Oz, the oil cans from the Wizard of Oz when you were talking. And um, <laughs> Joe, your, your Margot Lovejoy, I was thinking of it as a shroud, you know, in relationship to that. And then, and then Josette, your private time with the physical world, I really found that to be a wonderful, um, a wonderful, I don't know, metaphor for drawing as a way of kind of finding, finding a space in the world. Um, so if anyone has questions, I'm going to start to go through here, but um, you can unmute yourself. And um, someone said, how many of you use the color red normally in your work? Um, I mean, I can say for myself that I do very often, although it's not only. Um, I don't know, anyone else want to chime in um, about that? I, I said that we're all colorists, actually. So uh, no one's afraid of using red in their work. That's evident. But uh, many of us traverse through the spectrum. So uh, depending on the series, I would say, or the piece. Actually, I didn't use red. <laughs> well, but the stitching, maybe. So all of mine are more like monochrome, monochromatic. Yeah, for me, red was a little bit more of, I mean, it was a color, obviously, and in my show, it's a pretty, the primary kind of color in the exhibition, but for the group, I was thinking, you know, also conceptually about red at this time, seeing red, feeling, feeling anger or rage or passion and all of these kinds of the, the, the cycles of emotion that I think we all were going through throughout the entire pandemic. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of ways to, con to uh, interpret red. Someone said, um, for a more general question, being part of a newly formed collective, it'd be interesting to compare experiences, challenges, and goals. Well, I can certainly say that we do that <laughs> on a regular basis. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, I think that that's pretty powerful. I, as I said, anytime women get together in a room, in my experience in my life, and the numbers of collectives I've been a part of, just incredible things happen. So I don't know if anyone else wants to speak to that idea of collective. Yeah, I'm the one who asked the question. Hi. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Um, we started as a group of artists, uh, all located in Harlem, who were looking for a place to commune and share ideas, more on the conversational level about our work, not about opportunities, not about technical things, but really the internalization an externalization of our very sense of selves and our role as agents of, of culture. And um, like everybody else, we went from face-to-face -face meetings to the Zoom meetings. They gathered steam. They became more frequent. Then we morphed into uh, looking for an opportunity, which in fact we're going to be um, experiencing pretty soon on September 26th, where we're going to do an outdoor projection of our work on the building in Harlem. And I'm happy to share all that information. What and then of course, uh, that led to saying, well, how do you reach us and who are we and what do you know about us? And so now it's an Instagram and it's a website and it's all these other things that have also taken a lot of our attention in terms of the admin. And in, I'd add to that, you suddenly you get the uh, differences in the way each of us work and the different goals everybody has, and then personalities. So I was really curious as to whether you have, after this event, an agenda in mind. Are you going to keep meeting? Are you going to look for other opportunities? How did you form and structure yourself? So I'll just quickly, Joe, you want to say, I just want to say something. Can you, will you say the name of your collective? You, so yes, can, it's called Art Forms Us. Art Forms Art Us. Art Forms Us. Okay. Joe, you want to say something? <laughs> right. Well, I, yeah, I, I want to speak to that because it's interesting. You know, sometimes it's like, let's form a collective. In our case, it was like, it happened in spite of our, you know, in spite of us in a way, you know, because it was, there was, initially there was this energy and this great, great, love of art. I mean, we got off the plane in London and nobody wanted to sleep, no one wanted to eat. Well, eating a little bit, maybe drinking. But, you know, it was just this kind of, we have four days and just uh, taking it all in. And I think all seven of us felt like that. And that energy never waned. I mean, 
I've learned more also besides art and, and everyone, you know, everyone's personal stories and, and some of the things that we were going through collectively. I've learned more about recipes that I probably really needed to know. And also, as soon as someone mentions a book, I think three, half of us have ordered it by the time the person is, is off the phone at a Zoom, you know, or, or maybe while they're on a Zoom call um, or meeting, you know, really doing that. So I think, I think for us, I think the projects, we're not thinking about projects. They seem to just come out of us. I mean, we're, we're on a, um, an accordion book, we're right in the midst of a, a seven accordion books that we've been mailing around to each other. Um, this whole WhatsApp seems like a, a room installation in itself because there's at least 100 to 150 per day. So you can imagine over five months how much you know, communication. So I'm gonna stop there, but I just wanted to say it's happening in spite of anything that we might've planned for it, which is really lovely. Yeah, I think that one of the things for, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of a, always been a big advocate for artist run culture and um, alternative ecosystems and the ways that artists join together to make things happen, both inside kind of the greater structures and also outside of the greater structures, right? So we create opportunities for one another. And this did happen really organically. We just started, you know, this WhatsApp chat and then we were Zooming twice a week, which has consistently uh, continued through through today. We're still WhatsApping and Zooming. Um, and so, yeah, I think organically things just grow out of it and, and ideas happen. And, and yeah, so I think that it's a bit organic. And when we have a project, we formalize, but the relationships are, you know, the, those things come, the ideas come out of the organic nature of the conversations. And then when we're like, well, we're going to do this thing, like, for example, this exhibition, then we get down to like, okay, what's it going to be? How many pieces, you know, how are we going to think about that? So I feel like the ideas kind of pop out <laughs> like little, you know, branches off the, the tree of the relationships. And then, um, then we kind of take that and make it really concrete, which is, I think what artists do, right? We create something from nothing. So um, and you know what, if the greater structures aren't going to do it for us, then we're sure as hell going to do it for ourselves. So I think as we move forward in the world and, you know, some really difficult challenges ahead, I think, for artists, for artists' ecosystems, on top of all of the other, you know, obvious challenges, I think we have to reinvent ways to, to be together, to, to build relationships, to build collectives, to show our work. You know, we, we're here to make things for the world to see, right? We're, so. I, yeah, so that's my, <laughs> anyone else wants to chime in on that? Or any other questions? We'll just a few more minutes. I would love to hear anybody else to chime in. Such a wonderful group of people here. Let's hear your voices. I'll say before, um, originally with the trip, um, Patty Fabricant and I were in the car going to the Clemente Center um, to work on the second Among Friends show that we had put together last spring already. And um, she was reading an article on her phone in the car and it was saying that the Tate Museum in London was doing, taking their um, permanent collection and, and for the Me Too movement, um, only showing the women portion of that, curating in that way. And I said, oh my God, that sounds so amazing. We should go see that. I've never been to London. And literally in the car, she just like looked up the airline and it was like $150 round trip because it was in May of last year. And I was like, oh my God, book it. So we just booked it. So in the matter of like 10 minutes, we just went to London, right? Because we figured, oh, $150, if it doesn't work out, you know, it'll be okay. So um, the next day um, we went to go see Beth Derry in a group show. And at the show, we were like, Beth, you need to come. And Patricia was there and Josette was there. I'm like, you guys need to come to London. It's only $150. And then we had, I had met Ellen um, through another crit group that I was in. And we were walking on the beach um, that spring. And I was, then she actually, I think, paid $200 because she didn't get the ticket till June or something. And then she introduced us to Joe. So everybody just ended up, you know, mer merging together. So it was a really organic thing. So every, I think everybody knew each other a little bit. And then obviously after five days and seven museums and then a lot of drinks, everybody became best friends. The, um, the WhatsApp was really just before the trip, we all met for the first time um, at the Oyster Bar in Grand Central Station, because not everybody did know each other. And we set up the WhatsApp just as a way of being able to communicate um, using a free text when we were overseas. 
Um, and then when we came, and that was just a, a joke in and of itself. It took, you know, the seven of us like two hours to put that together. Um, but now everybody's a pro, so go figure. I think the pandemic has made everybody, you know, just better at all of this digital platform stuff. So that was just a way of communicating during the trip. And now it's like, I think I wake up in the morning and after two hours of work, I check it and it's at like a hundred chats every day. So <laughs> I just want to add that um, I also went and I got in on it because that's right. Sorry, sorry. Um, because I somehow Joe or Ellen said they were going and I said, wait a minute, if Joe and Ellen are going, I just did in a show with Joe that Ellen curated. How can I, I should go too. So I wrote to Patty and just glommed on and it has been such a transformative thing. I'm just so delighted that I was welcomed into this ever growing, I think their original plan was like a very small group of people. Now they had seven. I didn't stay with them. I had the tact to find another place to stay. <laughs> but um, everyone in this group, I was thinking of Alexi's work because of the stitching and everybody in this group whom I knew, I knew everyone individually through another, for another reason, but not collectively. And I knew everybody's work at the time. And what I find so brilliant about this show and what I think is so fabulous about the collective, it's as if Alexi's stitching has kind of stitched together these really extremely di disparate sensibilities. I mean, we agree about so many things in the world, but if you look at our work, the reason why the show is so strong and the collective is so interesting is that we're really all very grounded in our own sort of visions and Put them together and you get an extremely, I don't like to use the word conversation. Everybody uses it like 10,000 times a day. So I don't quite know what would be a better word, but just a wonderful kind of array of visions. And it has this sort of self-supporting quality because everybody's vision has its own integrity. So thank you for letting me come with you guys and I can't tell you how great it's been to wake up in the morning and see 71 next to my whatsapp yeah I have to say also that we're we're seven pretty um I like to say we're seven pushy women in the best sense of the term like it's, it's seven very opinionated very strong-willed very forceful women so you know it's not all like we, we, I mean, we debate, we kind of, you know, we have these intensive debates about everything and it's, that's, it's super fun, but everyone, because we're, you know, we're adults in the room, we kind of, we respect each other and those debates are really healthy and bring like lots of, you know, lots of um, different voices to the table in a way that does not mirror the discourse that is reflected in our public, you know, the public discourse of today does not um, reflect the kind of real conversations that I find people are having, like actual conversations that people are having, are not reflected in our media and our politics. Um, I think that people are really talking and wrestling with things and, and in meaningful ways. And I think that <clears throat> for me, uh, and I, uh, you know, I don't think it's too, too much of a stretch to say for everyone, the opportunity to kind of have those things, to, to wrestle out ideas, to be like, to really try and, you know, kind of you know, think of something, kind of unpack something and think about what you think about it. And, and someone else says something and you, you know, you really kind of change. I mean, I've, my mind has been changed so, by these people, which doesn't always happen, right? So I think that, um, you know, those kind of real intense conversations have been incredibly meaningful. And I feel like that as artists, and I do use the, the word conversations, Catherine. So <laughs> I think the work is a conversation. I think that artists are having conversations. And I think that if we can think somewhat strategically and politically about the conversations that we're having and about the conversations that the work is having. Um, I think that, you know, I, well, I'm idealistic. I think that, that artists really can make change through these conversations, through kind of the honesty of them, through the, the willingness to tangle with complicated ideas, to not kind of simply have a binary solution, you know, to accept really different voices. I think that's what artists do. That's what we bring to the table. It's what we can bring to the culture. Um, that's my hope anyway. <laughs> so I, I, I think if anyone has a last minute comment, we will kind of wrap this up. So one last comment, which is to urge people to actually see the show in real time. I was there today and there is a magical quality because of the <clears throat> way the light comes into the space because of these mylar, transparent mylar colors that have been pushed on the windows that really you cannot get in photographs and it creates an ambiance that's beyond that's the sum of everything in it and then a whole other kind of um cosmic reality and, and, and <clears throat> enveloping reality that is just really transfixing so 
go to it if you can. It's just yeah. really, really good. Trip. I have to say that I think this is one of the hardest shows to, that I've ever been in to photograph because of the nature of the building, the nature of the space, the relation, you know, the sort of way, it, you know, it's a domestic space, which is one, it's an amazing space to curate in and to think about your work in context of, but like to photograph is incredibly difficult. So yeah, so it is best, in, well, most art is best in person, but yeah. Ellen, did you want to say something to wrap us up? I do. Um, I also just wanted to say that in addition to our love of art and our technical skills that we want to encourage among one another. The thing that really is also happening emotionally on this WhatsApp chat that is ongoing is there's a real support as certain of us were starting to venture out for the first time from the lockdown to go to a protest to leave our apartment to not wash our groceries or to wash them. I mean, there was a high level of fear in just regular activity. And yet there we were supporting each other, judgment free. If somebody went and hit all of the protests, that was their choice and we supported it. If someone chose not to go to any of them, we supported it. So it is a judgment free zone uh, among the seven of us that I find um, extraordinarily helpful. And, um, and is the basis of real friendships. Um, so uh, I, I also wanna say as artists, we uh, gave a brief message. We're all working on these accordion pleated books in response to the USPS art project. And we're about two thirds of the way through the sharing of these books and passing them one to the other to the other. So you can expect another London Calling Collective down the road exhibition of these accordion pleated books and they they will be a beautiful encapsula encapsulization of studio practice during uh this this period in our lives that's been restrictive and oftentimes in a smaller studio setting so i'm excited for that too yes there's news about that soon <laughs> in fact we plan to include the whatsapp as you know, who knows, maybe we'll wallpaper the walls with it um, to kind of show the intimacy. So I just wanna thank everyone for coming. I wanna just say that, you know, this is, although the London Calling Collective has become an intimate family, um, and I'm in the middle of seven children, so it's <laughs> kind of makes a lot of sense to me, but um, the but I also think, so So we have this bond, but I, I think that one of the messages and one of the lessons of this is that it's it doesn't happen, it doesn't have to be just us, right? Like. Everyone, I think that the way that we're creating these intimate communities, I feel like that's my word of the night, um, the way that we're building relationships and kind of being really transparent, you know, just kind of being like, I'm all in, like, that's it, here, I'm here for you, I'll do what, what needs to be done, we do it together. I feel like that's what we can do for one another. I think that's what artist communities can do for one another. And so I encourage all of you to you know, either create your own collective or join in a project or reach out and, and speak to one another and try and try and engage. If we don't, as a culture, start engaging in those really difficult conversations, I think we're in very, I mean, we're already in serious trouble, but we'll be in even more serious trouble. So it's one of the things that artists can do, right? And that art can do is open up spaces of empathy in front of it and start conversations that are really challenging to have. So for all of you artists out there, and I see on this on this Zoom that there's a lot of you, um, I want to encourage you to to think of your art as a conversation and as a and as a space of creating empathy and and dialogue and discourse and and relationship. And um, maybe we can commit to that as artists um, in the times to come. So, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, really appreciate your taking the time. I know everyone's really zoomed out, but we really appreciate you spending this time with us. But this re this will be recorded, and as was last week, so you can can tell your friends <laughs> to access it later if you choose. And hopefully, we'll see you at the gallery or get in touch with us to you know who knows what we might collaborate on. You know, I'm I'm put it out there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Patricia.